What's going on everybody? Walt here for Overkill Projects and the greatest investment you can make is an espresso maker. So after a recent video from one of my favorite uh, YouTube vloggers, uh, Gerald at Gerald and Dunn, I purchased a new key light, which is a fancy word for the great big light that's next to me right here that shines on me when I take these videos. In fact, let me, uh, I'll show it to you real quick. You can see there is a great big light pointed at me. So this new light is the Sokani 60, which I picked up after seeing a review by Gerald over at Gerald Undone. I think he's amazing. You should check him out. Uh, not right now, but you know, after this video, go check him out. He's a cool guy. And after his very thorough review, I decided that this light would be a pretty solid investment because it costs about one sixth the price of its major competitors, but still offers most of the advantages of those lights. But it got me to wondering if there's any real difference in terms of the actual electronics itself between this and its competition. And now while I am not able to do a teardown of those lights, I can do a teardown of this one and see if it looks like this company has cut an awful lot of corners or something like that, or you know maybe the design is really messy and that's how they're affording to sell these lights so cheap. So today I am very, inadvisedly going to tear my new favorite light apart just to see what makes it tick. And since I was doing that, I thought maybe you'd like to see it too. Let's check it out. Here is the patient. And before we start ripping into it, why don't we take a look at how diodes actually work? And before we get too far into this, I just want to remind you that if you like what you see today, please consider giving me a thumbs up down below. If you like the video, it very much helps the channel uh, for, you know, the algorithms. So yeah, hit the like button and thanks for your support. Here is the circuit symbol for a diode. You see it kind of looks like an arrow with like a little line in the front of it. And that's because this is descriptive of how a diode functions. In practice, a diode works just like a one way wire. So every diode is going to have a forward voltage and that's kind of like a threshold. And once the voltage between the anode and the cathode of a diode gets high enough and surpasses that forward voltage threshold, a current can then flow through the diode. And now it's gonna flow through the diode in the direction of the arrow and that's why it kind of looks like an arrow. On the other hand, if we flip the voltage around and we have a positive voltage on the cathode and our negative voltage on the anode, the current cannot flow backwards through this device. Instead, the electrons try to go the other way and they hit a brick wall. And now that's why there's a line at the end of the arrow. It's kind of like a brick wall that's preventing any electrons from going the opposite direction. An LED is just a special kind of diode. There's tons of different kinds of diodes, but an LED is just a diode where once current starts flowing from the anode to the cathode, the actual device begins to light up. That's why it's called an LED, a light emitting diode. If you look in the data sheet for an LED, you'll often see listed not not only the forward voltage, but you'll also see a test current given. Now this is the current at which the manufacturer thinks, you know, you're going to be convinced that this LED is lit up bright enough. For little LEDs like this that you typically get in like an electronics kit, that number is around 10 milliamps. For a great big COB light, like the one that we're about to take apart, that number is gonna be closer to one or 1.5 amps. And now, since we know the optimal current that we want to flow through this LED, what we usually do is build a constant current source in order to get this thing to light up optimally. And that's what I have set up here. You can see, you know, I have three volts of input. This LED has a forward voltage of about 2.3 volts, which leaves us with about 0.7 volts that we want to drop across a resistor. Now, the reason that we want to drop it across a resistor is because a resistor works like a constant current source, thanks to Ohm's law, as long as we keep the voltage voltage constant. And so using Ohm's law, if we want two milliamps to flow across this LED, then we want a resistor of about 330 ohms. You can see here when I put it all together and turn on the power supply, it lights up just like we expect. And the COB light's gonna work exactly the same way, except that it is difficult to adjust a constant current source. And as you know, we want to be able to adjust the amount of light this thing outputs. Luckily, there's a very easy way to make up for this. Instead of actually dropping the amount of current down, we can simply turn the constant current source 
off every once in a while. If we turn it on and off fast enough, our eyes won't even notice that it was ever turned off, and instead we're gonna see the intensity of the light drop. So what a manufacturer will do is they'll take a cycle time that's way below our threshold for vision. So say one millisecond. And then they'll say, okay, during the course of a one millisecond cycle, we can turn this LED off for a certain percentage of that time. So if I turn the current source on for half a millisecond and then off for half a millisecond, and then I just keep repeating that, what I'm going to see is about 50% power in my LED. Now, if I adjust that number, if I leave it on for say 70% of the time and turn it off for 30% of the time, then I'm gonna see about 70% power. And this is what's called pulse width modulation or PWM. And the pulse width in PWM refers to the amount of time that I leave the pulse on. Now that's actually one of the things that's kind of mystifying about you know the price differences between these lights is that they're all going to work pretty much exactly the same. But PWMs themselves are extremely easy to build and I expect that we're just gonna see a simple controller that implements a PWM across the current source and lights up our LED accordingly. Okay, moving on to the actual teardown of this thing. So there aren't a ton of screws anywhere on the outside that I can see. I suspect that there's a few buried on the back, but that's okay. I'm going to take off this mount on the front and the, uh, the little dome that holds the actual COB on. And I'll see if I can't take those parts out sort of through the front of this thing and access the circuitry from there. Here you can see the actual COB chip and it's mounted on this huge heat sink with like heat pipes and fins and there's a fan mounted underneath. It's pretty bulky, but this thing must throw off a ton of heat. And speaking about heat, this is an 80 watt lamp. So we should expect really a lot, a lot of heat from this thing when it's running at 100%. And you can see this thing is pretty well jammed in tightly in the front uh, it's a little bit of work to sort of wedge it out and unplug it from the circuit board but I managed to get it out and of course it's still very difficult to access the circuit boards which is no surprise these things are meant to be assembled not disassembled so I had to carve little holes where the screws are in the back panel but that's okay it's super easy now to get this back panel off and get direct access to the circuit boards underneath and here you can see the entire circuit board assembly this is where all the magic happens other than the light itself you can see this little uh, Wi-Fi antenna sticking out of the front here and that explains a lot about the really weird remote control that comes with this thing. You might be able to see on the back panel there's a little divot where it goes. There's a channel on the inside here that you can see and that's where they jam the antenna. It's pretty easy to pull out of that though. The only other thing that was kind of a pain is I had to unsolder the power switch and the power input but those were pretty easy to access and unsolder and they'll be really easy to get back on when I'm done this. And up here you can also see the coded rotary switch that you use to change the intensity of the light. Now the entire assembly is actually made up of two boards, a top board and a bottom board and here's the front of the top circuit board which contains pretty much only the LCD and four tactile switches for the different functions. The back of the top board, however, is where all the magic happens. You can see there's a lot more going on back there. One of the things they have going on is a little Wi-Fi module. This is just a Nordic NRF24. And they use this Wi-Fi module to interact with the remote control, which is really kind of weird and old school looking, kind of looks very 90s as on off switch. And that's clearly so the Wi-Fi module on the remote control doesn't just drain the battery while this thing is on. It also contains a mystery microcontroller, and that is the same microcontroller that they have on the circuit board in the lamp itself. Now, of course, they don't have any markings on this microcontroller because they think that that's going to somehow prevent uh, reverse engineering, which it would not because if you know how this light works, then you would be able to use pretty much any microcontroller you wanted to to recreate the exact same device. So why companies go through so much effort to hide information that was already trivial, I don't know. And here is the front side of the bottom board. You can see here that this is where a lot of the actual stuff happens. You can see that there's a big honking inductor on here, a nice power transistor, some current sense resistors, and a bunch of other passive components, as well as an actual PWM controller. And in this case, the particular PWM controller that they are using is the FP7209 from Feeling Technology, which is a company I am not familiar with. But here I'll link in the data sheet and you can check out down below. I'll put links to it in the description, but pretty much all the circuitry that you see on this board matches the typical application circuit that they have listed in the data sheet. It doesn't really deviate that much from just the standard design. And for example, you can see the great big current sense resistors. That's part of the feedback loop. We have a great big inductor that's positioned right in front of the main diode, as well as this capacitor here and some capacitors on the back. And speaking of capacitors, these are Hua Hong brand, which I don't know. And hopefully they're good because, you know, bad caps can seriously mess up your day. But let's hope that's not a concern. 
Now checking out the actual PWM signal from the controller, I had to bodge in a couple of wires so that I could probe this thing uh, properly so you can see it on the oscilloscope. But when I put it up on the oscilloscope, you can see pretty clearly uh, when I'm at 50%, I've got you know a 50% uh, PWM cycle right here. And then as I lower that down, we'll see that the signal you know narrows and goes down. It actually looks like it doesn't go down all that far, maybe down to like a 30% PWM cycle. And then when I ramp this thing up to go towards full power, you can see that it doesn't really look like it goes very much beyond say 50% and as I get really close to 100% it actually flips into a slightly different wave configuration where this thing is on a little bit longer but now it actually changes the way it cycles so that there's not too much power going through during one cycle. And that's one of the niceties of using like a prefab PWM controller is that it takes into account some of the little sort of adjustments that you need for the passive components that you would have to figure out by yourself if you were just trying to drive something like this with a microcontroller. All right, and there you have it. That was the inside of the Sokani 60. Uh, it's actually exactly what we expected to see out of a light like this. You know, it works the same as you would expect any LED light to work. Um, and so the question going in was, you know, why is this one sixth the price of the competing lights? And the answer is, I don't really know. Uh, you know, without being able to tear down those lights now, it would be very difficult for me to know if there's any real material advantage in terms of electronics with those lights. Now that said, obviously some of the actual components on the inside were on the cheaper side of things, but you know, a few cheaper caps is not going to make up you know, several hundred dollars worth of difference. Now, that said, this light does have shortcomings. You know, I have to put a book underneath the light between the light and the clamp because the clamp isn't tight enough to hold the light up when I have accessories on it. And so, like you saw before, you know, I have this great big uh, softbox diffuser on here, this big parabolic thing, and that weighs enough that it weighs down the clamp and there's no way that it can hold itself up no matter how tightly I clamp it. Uh, and then there's a couple other things like, you know, the remote is kind of weird like I said, but it's a wireless remote, so I can kind of understand why they went with the design that they did, even if it is weird. And there are bits and pieces of it that might feel a little bit clunky compared to nicer lights, but I don't know that I really think that there's a huge advantage other than that those competing lights when you go to set them up you know if you're on the road or you're traveling to make some videos or something like that they're just going to work when you set it up and you clamp it all in you know that it's going to hold tight it's just going to do exactly what it's supposed to do the way that you've done it every single time and that type of consistency is probably where that value is being made up now that's not to say that a company like this can't improve this light to a place where it kind of feels that way but clearly they sort of either rushed this to market or just decided, you know, we can build this, we can build it cheaper, and then they did, and it's not quite as good, and that's sort of what you expect to see. So I guess really the conclusion of this video is that, you know, hopefully companies like this can keep on improving and sort of, you know, drive that market to be uh, a little bit better in this price range. And then, you know, that'll trickle down and hopefully the slightly more expensive lights will be even better still. And all right, that'll do it for today. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I know I did. If you did, make sure you leave me a thumbs up. The subscribe button's down there. You know where to find it. And uh, leave a comment down below. Oh, and check the description for links to this light and, you know, its competition. You can check it out yourself uh, and some other information about the stuff that we looked at today. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.